Good morning, friends, and welcome to Smoky Hill United Methodist Church's uh, Facebook Live worship service. We're so glad that you've joined us and uh, want to say a special welcome to folks who may be uh, joining us for the first time. We're glad that you are here and I want to invite everyone to take a moment and sign the, attendant, or sign the attendance pads, yes. <laughs> so, say hi to each other in the chat on the side. Uh, would invite you to do that and, uh, and, and greet one another in that way. This last week, we, uh, we gather this morning in the context of, of another week of uh, dealing with COVID-19, um, dealing with local issues related to um, uh, injustice and racial injustice in particular, and um, we've seen some of the, the, the depths of our sinfulness as human beings, as well as some beautiful, wonderful um, uh, examples of, of how we live together and how we uh, are able to grow together in God's grace. And um, we bring all of that with us to worship today and every, every Sunday. And so I'm glad that you're here as we, as we worship together this Independence Day weekend. Um, I want to say a special uh, uh, celebration, and uh, today is uh, Pastor Felicia's one-year anniversary of being here, and uh, we're glad that, yes, there's a little cl clapping here, and uh, we are, are grateful for her ministry. Um, and just so everybody's clear, a week ago at annual conference when they read the appointments, both Pastor Felicia and I, as well as uh, Pastor Lucia um, Correa, we've all been reappointed, so we're here for uh, uh, at least another year. And finally, I just want to say that we're having communion today. We're celebrating Holy Communion. We want you to join us. If you haven't already gathered your communion elements, I invite you to do that at some point during the service today. And we would love to see pictures of your communion setup, whatever little altar or coffee table or TV tray that you might set your communion on. Um, we'd love to see those pictures um, and maybe use them in future worship services. So if you have a minute, take a picture of your, and, and if you can put yourself in it, even better, and then send it along to, uh, to us here at Smoky Hill. That would be really awesome. I'm going to invite Pastor Felicia to come and to share our uh, announcements for this morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to worship this morning. Again, if you are visiting with us for the first time, please let us know you're here. Type in the chat box where you're from. If you have prayer requests, we believe in prayer. Please include that. We want to pray for you. Thank you for being here. We don't have a lot of announcements today. Um, as you know, we pray as a church, loving our church through prayer. And this week's prayer focus is our envisioning a different world, our participating in creating a different world in which injustice is replaced with a renewed sense of solidarity and care. So praying for ourselves and the ways in which we can create a different world, or as that saying goes, um, we can work on being the change that we want to see in the world. Also, if you are not plugged in, we have a number of different virtual Bible study groups. And they're not just Bible study groups. They're a place to connect with community. And so please go to the website if you're not familiar. We have a number of them. Um, I'm sure we will cover your interest. And please feel free, even if you are not a quote-unquote member of Smoky Hill United Methodist Church, we welcome you to plug into our community and learn more about us and just to get connected during this time that we, maybe some of us are feeling disconnected and really socially distanced. And finally, good news, um, starting on July 7th, Carol, our uh, church, she's more than our church secretary. She's like, she's like, I don't know, she's like a, a office manager Yoda. She's pretty awesome. Um, anyway, she's coming back and she's going to be in the office on, let's see, the following hours, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday mornings from 9 to noon. No, that does not mean the entire church is open and a come as you will. We are still socially distancing. We are still practicing safety in the midst of COVID. Um, but Carol is going to start coming in and it's just a step in us slowly coming back um, into the building. So we are excited about Carol being willing to do that. 
Those are the announcements. Let us go into worship. Please join in the call to worship. Great Spirit, you have turned your face earthward and opened your heart to your children. And so, O oh God, do we turn to you now. We turn to you for purpose and correction. For joy and peace. For a way out of hopeless situations. For justice. For forgiveness. For love. We turn to you, O oh God, for all these things offered through Jesus the Christ, the maker of redemption and the bringer of hope. Amen. Amen. Please join me in our opening hymn, Welcome. Let's walk together for a while and ask where we begin to build a world where love can grow and hope can enter in to be the hands of healing and to plant the seed of peace singing welcome Welcome to this place, you're invited to come and know God's grace. All are welcome, the love of God to share, cause all of us are welcome here. All are welcome in this place. Let's talk together of a time when we will share a feast. When pride and power kneel to serve the lonely and the least And joy will set the table as we join our hands to pray Singing welcome, welcome to this place you're invited To come and know God's grace, all are welcome of God to share, cause all of us are welcome here, all are welcome in this place. Let's dream together of the day when earth and heaven are one, a city built of love and light, the new Jerusalem. Where our morning turns to dancing, every creature lifts its voice, crying, welcome, welcome to this place. You're invited to come and know God's grace. All are welcome, the love of God to share, because all of us are welcome here. All are welcome in this place. Let's talk about Jesus, the King of kings is he, the Lord of lords supreme throughout eternity. The great I am, the way, the truth, the life, the door. Let's talk about Jesus more and more. Breathing you every step. 
step I take, I take in you. You are my way, Jesus. Every breath I take, I breathe in you. We want to thank um, our um, Director of Family Ministries again for being so creative and being with our children for the Vacation Bible Study. It was so great to see that, that we're still loving on our kids and teaching them about God, even in the midst of this. So thank you so much, Crystal, for all that you do. It is now time to go to God in prayer. And as we prepare for prayer, we want to say special prayers for Naomi Post, who will be having surgery tomorrow. Aaron Heiss, who will be having surgery on Friday. 
We want to continue to pray for Chris Allen, who had back surgery, um, Nancy Friday's mother-in-law, um, as well as her aunt. We want to pray for Donna Harris's children. Um, we want to pray for her son, Christopher, who is living in Japan, where they are not as strict with the wearing of face masks and social distancing, as well as for her daughter, Carly, who's not sure that she will have employment um, when school starts again in August. We also want to lift up um, those who um, continue to be affected by COVID, especially those in the most vulnerable um, groups. And of course, continued prayers for justice and peace to prevail in our country as well as in our world. Let us take a moment to go to God in silent prayer as we center our hearts. Loving God, we thank you for another beautiful day and for the breath of life. We are grateful that your sustaining grace brought us through yet another week and brought us to yet another opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth. Creator God, you created us to walk with you Help us to be fully present to you in this time of worship that we may be strengthened to do your will and to walk in your way all the days of our lives. Bless us with your grace and your rest that we might find renewal and the strength to run with perseverance the race that you have set before us. We praise you, Lord Jesus, for carrying those burdens that are too heavy for us to carry on our own. We thank you and we praise you that even as we pray now, you are interceding on our behalf. As we pray for those who are struggling with health concerns, whether it be acute or chronic, we thank you, God, for being the great physician and for bringing healing and restoration to their bodies, for being with those who care for them, Lord, that they might receive good care. We pray for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones, O oh God. In Jesus' name, we pray that you would envelop them in your comfort and in your love. We say special prayers for the Watley family, the Otterburn family, the Gray family, the Lake family. God, we continue to pray for our sick and shut-in who may be feeling the social distancing and the disconnection in ways that the rest of us are not. Be with them, we pray, and help us to be with them in ways that they will feel your love, your comfort, and your presence. God, we thank you in advance, as always, for hearing and answering our prayers. As we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. As we prepare for our offering, we just, you know, we never get tired of saying thank you to this community for its generosity, all the ways that you give, both of your finances, your time, 
um, your gifts and your talents. We are very grateful and we say thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, as we prepare, please know that our missions team, we have a wonderful missions team. They continue to be outside on Sundays, both giving out masks and giving out other things that um, can help the community. But also they're there and we're here um, to take your gifts. You're also free to give those online. Um, you can see that on our Facebook page as well as on our website um, on how to give electronically. Um, but however you choose to give, we just want to say thank you. Let us pray. God, you are the giver of every good and perfect gift. And we thank you for every gift that is given, whether it be in the form of finances, time, or gifts, spiritual gifts. And we pray that whatever the gift is, that it may renew lives in our community, our nation, and in our world. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Genesis, chapter 18, verses 1 through 15. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mar Mamre, as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant, who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared, and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. He said to them, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age, it had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, <laughs> After I have grown old, and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time, I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, oh, yes, you did laugh. <laughs> Thank you, Joan. Will you pray with me? O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and minds together be acceptable in your sight. And through this time together, through your word, may we hear your voice and know your presence and be moved to act in your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Central to this story of, um, of uh, Abraham and Sarah and these strangers who uh, come upon them in their, uh, at their uh, camping site, um, central to that is hospitality, an understanding of what it means to open oneself up to another and um, how important that was in, in other cultures and in other times, but how central it is to us 
today as well, even as we've kind of gone away from that a little bit. Our bishop, Karen Alavito, has uh, shared a video this morning with uh, us to, to share with you all, um, talking a little bit about hospitality in, the, in, the, the, um, in our culture today and what it means as far as our churches. For many churches, this is the first Sunday they're welcoming a new pastor. Um, and we're going to watch her message, and then I'll continue with the sermon. I like to read a lot. Ever since I was a child, one of my favorite weekly activities has been my trip to the public library to check out several books to get lost in. I have a very vivid memory as a small child of trying to figure out how to read. My parents were sitting at our kitchen table looking over the newspaper. I knew that they were able to read what was on the page, but how? I remember staring at the page and straining and even crossing my eyes trying to get those hieroglyphics to make sense. I was so frustrated that I couldn't read. That memory is so embedded so deeply within me that years later I realized what part of the paper my parents were reading that night. The classifieds. Those pages of the paper that are so distinct from all the others with their tiny, tinier, tiniest type of the whole paper. To this day, whenever I read a paper, I always love perusing the classifieds. It's not like I'm looking for anything, but it's more a sense of victory over that early mystery of the classified hieroglyphics. When I was in high school, I discovered an even more intriguing section, the missed connections. You know what I'm talking about. Ads that say things like, you were discussing whether you need to buy that orange top because it's a little too orangey. I mentioned that it's a good color on you. Hope you remember me. I was using, this is my favorite, I was using the unisex bathroom in the subway when you walked in. You looked to be in your early 20s with long blonde hair. You screamed and ran out, but when we made eye contact, I somehow felt there was a deeper connection and want to apologize and maybe explore it more. If you can tell me the subway as well as the color shirt I had on, I will know it's you. Also, sorry for accidentally going on the floor when I made that jerk reaction. You scared me when you opened the door. Hope to see you. Hope you see this. I'd love to see you again. All these missed connections. We have them every day. Each day, even while we are practicing physical distancing, people cross our path. People with wisdom, humor, something to teach us. And yet, most of the time, it's all missed connections. Several years ago, I did a funeral that I have never forgotten. At the start of the funeral, there were three people in the room, three people. And what I was struck by was that the grief in the room was not so much that the man had died, but rather the grief was for not getting to know him better while he was alive. The grief was not for the death, but for the missed life, the missed connection that could never be reclaimed, never reconnected through a personal ad or any other way. Missed connections. I have a hunch that they're more prevalent now in the 21st century than ever before. It's not just because there's more people to miss, but because we, at least those of us in the United States, have turned from a community-based society to that of an individualistic one. We're certainly seeing that as wearing a mask to protect others from COVID-19 has become politicized instead of simply what people do in a healthy community that they do for one another to keep each other safe. We've lost a sense that we're all in this together and instead are like those on a sinking ship. It's every person for themselves. We miss each other all the time. One day I was traveling on public transportation. I had my earbuds in and was so engaged in the game I was playing, okay, it was Candy Crush, that I was playing on my cell phone that I didn't realize that the train had stopped and there was a man who had collapsed and was lying on the floor I didn't realize that until paramedics entered the train. Talk about missed connections. We've lost a sense of connection and instead have become a community of strangers. I'm not sure if it's possible to have connection if we remain strangers. In fact, there is a huge disconnect in this present age. There's more food, more material goods, more capacity for sharing what we have than ever before. 
Yet, instead of feeling a sense of abundance, that there really is enough to go around, we've created a sense of scarcity, which creates a fear of the other, a fear of strangers who can and may take it all away from us. What a strange evolutionary path we humans have been on. There was a time, especially in places of scarcity, when the culture demanded hospitality towards strangers. In the Bible, the book of Hebrews reminded its readers do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. This was a time of much scarcity. Food and water were hard to come by, and finding it was essential for the traveler's survival in the arid environment. The cultural ethic of the time was to welcome the stranger as an honored guest. This ensured the survival of the stranger as well as the host. The stranger required the host's kindness for survival, and the host had to trust the stranger as that one was welcomed into their home. Leaving the stranger outside created hostilities that would endanger the host. There was a mutuality that bordered on a mystical presence, for by welcoming the strangers, some have entertained angels without knowing it. It's time we move from misconnections and return to welcoming the stranger. Imagine how different how rich and full our lives would be if we put down fear and embraced this ethic of hospitality. What if undocumented persons were treated with dignity instead of treated as an unwelcomed import? What if black and brown young people were welcomed in a store as potential customers rather than immediately met with suspicion? What if physical distancing was embraced as a sign that we see one another fully and it, that it's a way to show that we truly love our neighbors as ourselves. Imagine that world of extravagant hospitality, how divisions would fall away, and we delight in the unexpected gifts brought by strangers who we connected with. When we dare to welcome the stranger, we're all transformed. We keep our uniqueness, but the strangeness of the other wears off. The colors and the hues of the world become more brilliant, something to marvel at. What we have matters less than what we share. Byron Sherwin, a student of the great philosopher Abraham Heschel, remembers a time when his teacher taught him about how we all change when we dare to welcome the stranger. As was the custom, the members of Heschel's seminar would escort him home after the late evening class he conducted. Though the distance from the seminary to Heschel's home was only about eight blocks, the trip usually took an hour, he said. He said, we would walk a few steps and he would turn and discuss a point with us for a few minutes, and, and we would repeat this process until we arrived at his apartment house. One evening as we walked, a tall, young, haggard-looking blonde woman with two teeth missing and black welts under her eyes approached us. She told us that she was unemployed and earned money as a prostitute, that her child was taken from her, that her husband used to beat her, and that she had recently been confined to a hospital which we all recognized as a psychiatric hospital. One of us, he said, offered her money, perhaps because that was what she wanted, or perhaps to get rid of her. Suddenly, Heschel took her arm, asked her name, continued talking to her, and we all walked on. A block later, we met a writer and her husband, both of whom knew Heschel. Heschel introduced us and the woman to his friend and her husband, both of whom looked strangely at the woman and at Heschel. Heschel was undaunted. Holding her arm, he said simply, she's my friend. He began talking to the writer and her husband. Then that woman put her hand to him and with a tear in her eyes, she said, thank you, and continued to walk down Broadway. Hospitality turns strangers into friends and transforms our lives in the process. This is the first Sunday of a new appointment year. We United Methodists have a have a tradition that requires welcoming the stranger. Today, many of our churches are meeting new pastors for the first time. Other churches are preparing for yet another year with the pastor they've had. We pastors have pledged to the itineracy. That is, we know our assignment is year to year. Even knowing that goodbye is always looming, we are called to join the community to which we're appointed to fully and without hesitation. We are to love with our whole being and weather the pain of parting when it's time for us to move to another church. To both pastor and parishioner, Jesus gives a mandate. Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me, and anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet 
as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will not lose their reward. How we enter into a relationship together, pastor and parishioner, church member and visitor, is a reflection of our faith commitment to Jesus Christ, or lack of it. As you begin the new appointment year, may you live into the gospel's demands of radical hospitality and deep generosity. It's time to move from missed connections and create community. It's time to open ourselves to those around us and not only take notice of them, but welcome them into our lives and allow ourselves to be welcomed into theirs. It's time to stop being afraid of one another, and it starts today. Let the loving start. May we offer hospitality to one another, share the abundance of what we have with one another, and be surprised to find that there have been angels amongst us all the time. Let the loving start. I love that uh, line that uh, she shares toward the end of her message. Back at, uh, during the story of uh, Genesis, we recall that a, a few chapters before this and a few sermons before this, the promise had been given to Abraham, Abram and Sarah, Sarai at that time that through them um, a child would be born, a lineage would be begun, a people would be um, Lift it up to bring salvation, to, to redeem the world. Um, and Sarah and Abraham have been living into that, that hope, that reality. But they have settled into a reality that seems to be saying that's maybe not going to be happening. We heard about Hagar and the, the, the drama that happened related to um, that uh, incident in their lives. And it seems as if this promise is not going to come to fruition after all. And so our scripture today is filled with longing and hoping and waiting and, and groaning. Um, it seems as if this is never going to happen. But it's a birth announce, uh, announcement that we are in the midst of. It's these strangers who arrive and, we're told, are speaking from God. And the question that they're answering is, will the promise find its fulfillment? Will it be possible for this couple who have settled into their old age, settled into their way of life, is there something new that is going to be possible? In the first part of our scripture, verses 1 through 8, Abraham is the main actor, and he's running around furious, or in, a, in a furious, hurried um, uh, sense of, of pacing, which is anticipating something momentous about to happen. He's getting things ready to, to welcome these strangers. But then in the last verses, 9 through 15, things slow down and the strangers take center stage. The pace slows and the weightiness of the announcement that's about to take place becomes central. And the word that is spoken shatters reality. It shatters their assumed reality of we're too old to begin something new, to begin a family. Their world of barrenness is no longer all that is possible when these strangers speak their words. A new, hopeful narrative is offered. Something that is well beyond their ability to make happen themselves. They are indeed beyond childbearing age. But the question is asked, is anything impossible for God? Friends, the journey of faith can be scandalous and it can be difficult. It can shake us out of our comfort zones. It can shake us out of the places where we assume that we may be able to go and what might be possible. To accept that something so far outside the present perception of reality might be possible, something so far-fetched, 
is radical and can be world-shattering. It is to call out hopelessness and to challenge it with a fuller and more life-giving vision for the future. And it begins with a word, this word spoken by these strangers who happened to come upon Abraham and Sarah. I want to reflect just for a minute. There was a, a, a vision that a man received back in the 1940s that um, talked about what, uh, or was an example of what might be possible even given an impossible kind of situation. The man's name was Howard Thurman, and he um, was called in 1944 to go to San Francisco. And if you recall, 1944, uh, there's a world war going on. Um, uh, 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 Japanese Americans have been rounded up and have been sent to concentration camps. Racial um, uh, tension uh, was still very much, obviously, uh, a, a reality. Uh, Jim Crow laws, etc. But he had a vision. He was given a vision by God that he should start a church, a church called the Fellowship for All Peoples. And the vision that impelled him was this, as he put it. He said, The movement of the Spirit of God in the hearts of people often calls them to act against the spirit of their times or causes them to anticipate a spirit which is not yet in the making. In a moment of dedication, they are given wisdom and courage to dare a deed that challenges and to kindle a hope that inspires. And what he wanted to do was start a church that would go beyond uh, racial and ethnic and cultural um, divisions. And he put it this way, we're trying to live an experience for ourselves whether or not it is true that experience of, of spiritual unity and fellowship are more compelling than the fears and dogmas and prejudices that separate us. And if these experiences over time would be able to undermine any barrier that separates us from the other. What a beautiful vision. What a, what a beautiful opportunity to see beyond what might be possible or what we think might be possible and to see something on the horizon to which a people could be called to move toward. You notice in our scripture reading today that um, the story is left quite unresolved at the end of our scripture. Uh, Sarah's laughed, and then she denies laughing, and the strangers leave. And there they are. This denial of her laughter is just hanging in the air. And we don't know what's going to happen next. But the word has been uttered. And the word has said that not everything depends on us. Not everything depends on us even catching a vision of it. Sometimes we can just scoff at a vision. But if God utters the word, it can become. God's power is not limited to our expectations. Thank goodness. God's power is not limited to our expectations. Now, we all know, as individuals and as a community of faith, about the often futility of our best efforts at faith, about our sometimes deep resistance to the gospel at just the moment when we intend to be faithful, we find that we blow it. We find that we, we don't have the, 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 the heart or the strength or the courage to, to live into it. And we recall that these words from Genesis were spoken to a displaced, tired, and wondering people in exile who felt like the end had come upon them as they lived in this strange land among strange people. When we find ourselves in situations like that, sometimes it is all we can do to keep going. And over and over and over and over and over again, 
we find ourselves hanging our heads, wondering truly if it is possible that something new can happen. We confess our sinfulness and recognize our place in the inability for us to get beyond where we know that God is calling us to go. But even as we do that, we find ourselves invited over and over and over again to take our place at a table. And the table is not our table, it's the Lord's table. And we recognize that as we take our place at the table, we do not deserve to be there. But because it is God's table, and because we know that we cannot get it right on our own power, we dare to join God at God's table and to be reminded that it's not our power, it's not our um, vision even, it is God's vision, it is God's power. And we participate, we partake at the table and we find their connections. We're reconnected to God, we're reconnected to each other. And we can find the strength to move forward into that vision that God has called us to. Whether it's having a baby at a, at a strange time, in a strange place like Sarah and Abraham, or whether it is simply recognizing that a new something is starting among us, is, is rising up among us. We are drawn into that shared future with each other. And we look for how God is going to act and invite us in. Will you join us at that table? Will you allow God to speak to you and to speak to us together as we gather with the trust that God is continuing to strengthen us and lead us and guide us into new and strange lands because of God's promise, because of God's faithfulness, and because of God's power. Thanks be to God. Amen. Tim is going to lead us into our uh, sharing in communion uh, with the singing of Let Us Be Bread, and invite you to sing or hum along as well as we prepare the communion table. Join with us in our prayer of great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Almighty God, creator of the universe, ruler of all nations, judge of all flesh, you have placed us, your people, in this land made rich with rivers forests, mountains, and creatures great and small. 
Here you set before the founders and pioneers of this nation an opportunity beyond measure to build a realm of justice, peace, and freedom. Here you continue to call your people, freed from the law and baptized into Christ Jesus, to be a sign of your reign in all the world. For such a place, such a vision, and such a calling, we give you thanks, praying that we may ever join afresh the dreams you set before us. And so with your people in every land on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn, Holy, 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 Holy Lord, God, God of power and might, heaven, heaven and, and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Above all, we give you thanks for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who sends us into the world to declare the good news of your kingdom to every creature, justice to all peoples, good news to the poor, release for prisoners, sight for the blind, and freedom for the oppressed. On the night that Jesus was to be betrayed, he took bread, gave God thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body which will be broken for you. When supper had ended, Jesus took the cup. Again, he gave God thanks. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and drink, all of you. This is the cup of my blood of the new covenant. It will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And so we remember again as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will come, come again. We pour ourselves out before you in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Pour out your spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make Christ known to us in the breaking of this bread and in the sharing of this cup. Renew our fellowship in him, that we may be for the world his body, poured out for the world at this time in this nation and at that great banquet in the fullness of your new creation, where justice flows like rivers, righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, where none shall hunger or thirst neither shall they learn war any more. By him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. At home, if you want to take your bread, take and eat. This is the body of Christ. Take and drink. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. O oh God, you have given yourself for us from this table, 
we are called to go forth to give ourselves to others. We thank you for the gift of your very self. Bless us, we pray, through this meal and through our connection with each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is uh, one that is a celebration of uh, this weekend and a celebration of uh, our, um, our journey together as a people um, creating a more perfect union as the United States of America. America the Beautiful. I think Tim's going to lead us. And thank you, Tim. appreciate the, the last verse of that hymn. It calls us to a deeper vision beyond where we are, um, recognizing that we're not living yet in that time of undimmed tears, um, that we still are on a journey toward who God is calling us to become. Know that God is calling you to become something more as well. And wherever you are in your life, whatever struggles you may be feeling, within your very soul or between your families as, as you struggle perhaps financially, know that the possibilities for you are not limited to what you see before you. That God speaks and new possibilities become a reality. May God speak a word to you of hope, love, and joy. And may you go forth from this service renewed in your commitment to listen and hear what God may be saying to you. Go in peace. Amen. May you run and not be weary. May your heart be filled with song. And may the love of God continue to give you hope and keep you strong. And may you run and not be weary. May your life be filled with joy, and may the road you travel always lead you home. And may the road you travel always lead you